Coming to you now is Lahem Panim with your host, Pastor Cameron Urey, Senior Pastor and Bible Teacher at Renton Park Chapel in Renton, Washington. Hello and welcome to Lahem Panim. So glad you could join us today as we continue our study of the book of Acts. You remember that last week we talked about the Holy Spirit's coming at Pentecost and Peter's explanation to the crowds of what they were witnessing. And it's that explanation that Peter continues in our passage today. He says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that he would set one of his descendants on his throne. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now, the first part of Peter's focus here is on what was happening at that time. The Holy Spirit had come. But next, he explains how it happened. Jesus was alive. Now, Jews and proselytes to Judaism, they had come from all over the empire to celebrate Passover, and many of them stayed for Pentecost as well. And so everybody there was keenly aware of the events in and surrounding the crucifixion of Jesus. They had heard of his miracles, they had witnessed his arrest, his trial, his crucifixion, and many of them had even heard of the empty tomb. Though the religious leaders had put out an official statement that Jesus' disciples had stolen the body in order to convince people that he had risen from the dead as he said he would be. But Peter counteracts that statement with four major proofs of the resurrection. And the first of these regarded the person of Jesus himself. The people knew that Jesus was a teacher from Nazareth who had performed many signs and miracles. And those signs pointed to who he is. You remember that Nicodemus, a member of the Sanhedrin, he acknowledged this all the way back in John chapter 3, verse 2, when he said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And so this crowd is filled with witnesses to many of these signs as well, and to what and how Jesus had taught with that amazing divine authority. These signs were not done in a corner, as Paul later states to Festus and King Agrippa. Everyone could see that God's hand was on Jesus in a special way. And yet, as Peter reminds them, Jesus died, which would ordinarily look like defeat. But Peter, interestingly, he describes Jesus' death in terms of birth pangs, thereby suggesting that the tomb was a womb out of which Jesus was born into resurrection glory. Now, Peter's second proof was the prophecy of David, 
He quotes Psalm 16, which talks about one who was released from the power of death. Verses that obviously couldn't apply to David, who at this time was already dead, already buried. But rather, Peter was saying that David was a prophet. And being a prophet of God, David wrote about the Messiah, that his soul would not remain in Hades, the realm of the dead, or his body in the grave where it would decay. So, as always, there's this pointing back to the Old Testament and how Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament. The Old Testament supports the resurrection of the Messiah. Now, the third proof that Peter offers was the witness of the believers themselves, who, think about it, had just spent 40 days with a resurrected Jesus. Now, you can say they were all hallucinating a resurrected Lord. Some modern theories actually suggest that there was a certain type of hallucinogenic mushroom that all of them were smoking. I'm not kidding. Um, And that's what caused this group hallucination. But any psychiatrist will tell you that people rarely hallucinate the same thing, and certainly not all at the same time. And here we'd be talking about 120 believers all hallucinating the same thing simultaneously. And this is further complicated by the fact that the disciples were not even expecting Jesus to rise from the dead, and they themselves had to be convinced that it was true. And you think also, you know, they had nothing to gain and really everything to lose facing official opposition, even imprisonment and death for embracing and teaching a resurrected Christ. So why would they do this if they knew it to be false? You know, while there have been people throughout history who sacrificed themselves on the basis of false information, few, if any, did so knowing their belief to be false. And that's the difference. But that is what the disciples would have been doing if they had stolen the body. Nobody does that. And so all of this points to the reliability of the disciples as credible witnesses. They can be trusted. And this is further evidenced by their message being backed up repeatedly by miracles in and throughout the book of Acts, which we'll see as we proceed. Now, the fourth proof that Peter offers is what the people are here experiencing, and that is the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Now, follow Peter's logic. He's saying that if the Holy Spirit is in the world, then God must have sent him. The prophet Joel, whom we mentioned last week, promised that one day the Holy Spirit would come, and Jesus himself had promised to send the gift of the Holy Spirit to his people. But if Jesus is dead, then he can't send the Holy Spirit. And therefore, because the crowds can see the Holy Spirit at work, Jesus must be alive. Furthermore, Jesus, he could not send the Spirit unless he had returned to heaven, to the Father. And so Jesus has ascended to heaven. And to back up this statement, Peter quotes Psalm 110 verse 1 which talks about one who would sit at the right hand of God, a verse that certainly couldn't be applied to David. So Peter's conclusion is clear. Jesus is the Messiah. He had risen and he sits at the right hand of God and he has sent the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a lot of discussion among many churches today about how to be more seeker-friendly, how to make your church a place that new people will feel safe and comfortable. And the one thing they say you never, ever want to do is sound judgmental or condemning. Why? Well, because you might offend someone and they won't want to come back. And if they don't come back, how will they ever find a relationship with Jesus? But I love this first sermon of the Christian church that Peter preaches because Peter, he ignores all of that all that let's just try to be nice kind of philosophy. And he preaches exactly how Jesus himself had preached. His message directly confronts their sin. Now, in verse 23, Peter says, basically, Jesus is your Messiah, but you crucified him. And he says again in verse 36, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus whom you crucified. 
Now, he could have presented the message in a general sense. He could have said that the cross was the place where Christ, as the sinless Lamb of God, died as a substitute for the sins of the whole world. But no, Peter doesn't gloss over the painful reality of how personal all of this was. They, Israel, had killed their own Messiah. That, more than any other atrocity ever committed, greater than the Holocaust, greater than any mass extermination ever committed on this planet, nothing even compares to what Peter said that these men and women did. They had killed the Son of God. Can you imagine preaching a message like that? Peter did. Why? Because it's often only when we come to grips with the full weight of our sin that we are willing to then seek forgiveness and restoration from that sin. Niceness, it doesn't save people. A gospel that's watered down to not offend anyone, that doesn't save people either. It's only through Christ crucified for you and for me that we can be saved. And that's why we also need to be confronted by the fact that it was our sins that held him there on the cross. You know, one movie that has had an incredible impact on the world is the movie The Passion of the Christ, a film directed by Mel Gibson. But one interesting behind-the-scenes fact about that movie is that while the crucifixion scene was being filmed and the soldier was getting ready to drive the nail through the hand of Jesus, the camera moved to a close-up shot of the soldier's hand. But it was actually Mel Gibson's own hand that hammered the nail into Jesus. And Mel Gibson, he wanted to drive home the point, literally, that all of us are responsible for the death of the Son of God. Now, the people here, after hearing Peter, they have happened to them exactly what always happens when the gospel is presented as it is meant to be presented. It says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Now, unfortunately, we don't have the rest of Peter's sermon. But its core message was one of repentance. Believe, repent, be baptized as a sign of that repentance, and come and follow Christ. And we see that for these first Christians, it meant radical change. A change in their hearts, a change in their minds, through the Holy Spirit that reoriented the entire way that they did life. And we will explore this more in the coming weeks. But God's message to you and to me today is exactly the same. Peter said to the people, save yourselves from this crooked generation. You'll remember that during Israel's 40-year banishment in the wilderness, the new generation saved itself from the older generation that rebelled against God. And similarly here, the nation of Israel would have about 40 years before Rome would come and destroy the city and the temple and scatter the people. And so history was repeating itself. And yet God was giving grace another 40-year period to repent, believe, and be saved. And we see here that 3,000 people do so. Now you and I are in another season of grace. And from the signs of the times, it looks like that time of grace is coming to an end. God's judgment is coming. And so now is the time to examine ourselves and ask ourselves, have we truly repented? Have we truly let go of all of our sin and chosen to follow Christ with all of who we are? Have we embraced the Spirit-filled life? If not, 
Or if you're not sure, then Peter's message of believing, repenting, and following Jesus is for you today. Tell Christ that you are giving your sins to him today, that you receive his forgiveness, and that you, with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength, you will follow him. If you commit to do that today, if you give yourself to Christ like that, the Holy Spirit will enter into your life, and your life will be altogether changed, altogether new. If you haven't done that, do it today. Amen. Today's episode of Lahem Panim has been made possible by Renton Park Chapel, a church that is committed to the ministry of sharing the joy of hearing and doing God's Word and to the mission of bringing people into the life-giving presence of Jesus Christ in and through vibrant preaching, teaching, Bible study, prayer, and ministry to a world that is in desperate need of the healing touch of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to learn more about our ministry here at Renton Park Chapel or would like to request any of our messages here on Lahem Panim, you can visit us online at rentonparkchapel.org or lahempanim.org. You can also find us on both Facebook and Twitter. We look forward to hearing from you and thank you for listening. And may you know all the fullness of having in your life the bread of the presence of God. Thank you.